How's that? Do what? Yeah. Wait a minute. Who's fats here? <laughs> Drummers think they're everything. You know, one thing I never understood, an old series, some things you just go, yeah, what were they thinking? When the Beatles started out, they had a drummer named Jerry Best. And he actually was put out of the group. And they brought in Ringo Starr. Now, I've watched Ringo Starr. I've heard him play the drums. At best, a moderate drum player. And I'm going, why did they get rid of Jerry Best? I don't know, was it his name, Ringo Starr? Or I, I never did figure that out. So Jerry Best, um, after the Beatles took off and got some fame, he released an album called Best of the Beatles. And they sued him, saying, you can't, you can't take our... But his title was actually true. He was Best... Jerry Best of the Beatles, I think he won the lawsuit, which surprises me. Um, and let me, uh, <clears throat> while I'm um, up here rambling, take your Bible, turn to Genesis, uh, let's see here, where was I? I think it was 29, Genesis 29, turn, somewhere around in there. Um, while I'm saying this, I mentioned this morning, of course, the, the message was about are we prepared to live this life for the Lord until we die, and are we prepared to give our lives for the Lord if required? And it's, it's something that, you know, you don't like to preach. Um, it doesn't make everybody feel all gooey and warm on the inside. But it is something that we're called to do. We, when you get saved, and you are really saved, all of a sudden the things of this world don't taste the way they used to. Um, I, I knew a guy from when we were down at Richwoods, he had a bad drinking problem. And he was trying to go to church at the time, and, and his drinking problem just really was getting in his way, and he knew it. And he didn't know, he tried to quit, and it just, it just wouldn't do it. And he begged God one day, just, God, take this away from me. And so one day he got up, and this was his testimony, one day he got up and uh, got his breakfast ready, which was, you know, scotch and whatever, whiskey or, and he said he took a few drinks of it like he normally would and lit up a cigarette like he normally would. All of a sudden, something felt funny and he went in the kitchen and threw up every bit of that scotch that he had poured for himself. And he said it made him sick. And so later on, he let his stomach settle down. He tried it again. And all of a sudden, he can't drink no more. And I believe, I believe with some people, God does that. I really do. And I will tell you this, God's timing is always good. Because he had, he had delivered him from the alcohol. And it was, a, a, you know, him and his wife... And they had a teenage daughter. She was right at that age where she was starting to get rebellious. And um, so in all the visits I had with them, I could tell that you know, him and his wife were really wanting to serve the Lord. They was dirt poor, lived down in Richwoods, didn't have nothing. And their daughter just didn't want anything to do with it. And one late Sunday evening after church, 
uh, an old boy came down the road where they lived on a three-wheeler and uh, asked her if she wanted to ride. Of course, there's a boy with a vehicle, so, you know, she's a 13-year-old girl. Yeah, I'll, I'll put my arms around you and hold you while you ride me around, sure. Well, he wrecked that thing, knocked her off of it, and it beat her head in pretty bad. They called me and said, she's up at Children's Hospital now. We don't know if she's going to make it or not. And uh, she eventually came out of the coma, and um, it, it disabled her mentally uh, for the rest of her life. But she basically turned back into a child again. And um, had that dad not been delivered from alcohol, I'm pretty sure that would have probably driven him over the edge with his drinking. Because that was hard to take. I was with that family all night long, Sunday night, and up at the hospital, and they were not doing good. And I was just going, God, please save this girl's life. So God just does everything at the right time. But um, this morning, I, 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 somebody had asked me about something I said. <clears throat> I went out to the foyer this morning and told the guys out there that sort of watch our church just kind of be a little bit more diligent right now. And uh, they're looking at me kind of strange. And, and I will go ahead and tell you... Um, I won't tell you everything, but I'll tell you something. Some of you might know, some of you don't know. But uh, on June 4th of this year, um, I reported uh, a child molester to the state of Missouri hotline. Um, the person that he was molesting reached out to me and told me what was going on and man I lost it I took down as much information as I could and understand something about ministers in this country uh, the laws have been changed since all the Catholic priests pedophiles you know have been discovered the priest would use the confessional to confess their child abuse sins to one another, they would be forgiven, quote unquote, of their sins and transgressions, and the church was willing to just leave that alone and say, okay, you're absolved, it's done, it's over with, uh, go back to your church. Well, uh, and because of the Catholic Church's position on the confessional, Nothing from the confessional is supposed to ever be made public to anybody who is not a Catholic priest or their, who their confessor is. Well, uh, the United States of America decided we're not going to do that. And so they passed laws in this country that while they still do honor the clergy confidentiality that even I has, a, I'm not even Catholic, but people will from time to time tell me, Pastor, I have, I have a problem with this, I have a problem with that, and so on. Uh, but I'm careful. I, I tell people, especially men, I'm going to stop you right here in case you don't know this. But if you're about to confess something to me that involves a child... I want you to know that as soon as you say it, I'm going to pick up the phone and I'm going to call the child abuse hotline. Because I'm just like the doctors over here at the hospital. I'm a mandatory reporter, which means I cannot not report it. I can't, I can't cover it up. I can't say, well, they told me that in confidence and their sins are forgiven. I can't do that. Um, and so when I was told about this particular person and not just what they had been doing but the amount of times it had been done I was staggered and um, I got on the child abuse report hotline website filled out 
a uh, detailed typed in report and um, sent it in and I was I was impressed 15 minutes after I reported that online I got a phone call from an investigator saying um, where is this person uh, where is the where is the child right now where is the uh, alleged perpetrator and asked me all those questions about it and I said for what it's worth I believe the person who gave me the report I believe I believe what they're saying and they went out right then and investigated it which was by by law they they have 24 hours to do that but it this was all done in a matter of two hours and I was very impressed by that and since that time a forensic investigator has gotten involved a forensic investigator is someone who is very well trained on determining whether or not children are not telling the truth or you know something something else is going on or they're very good at getting all of the details out of a young person that they can and uh, so that investigator took it very seriously the case is now before the prosecutor in Jefferson County and I want you to pray for that situation but all since June 4th um, the perpetrator and their spouse did not know who had turned them in they thought it was a um, thought it was a family member that had something against them was just trying to get them in trouble over something well uh, I'm not anonymous my name is part of the public record because I'm a mandatory reporter you if you are just a regular person and you call it in you can be anonymous so that there's no retribution but in, in my case or like a doctor's case or a lawyer's case uh, our name has to be public it's not anonymous and like I say they can't come against me legally for saying well you lied and you made all this up and you know, we're gonna sue you and your church and we're, you know we're gonna take all the pews out and sell it what they can't do that to me uh, but I will tell you that as Friday the perpetrator and or the alleged perpetrator and the perpetrator's spouse now know who it was that turned them in and they are not happy about it and so I am a very disliked person but I am convinced I did the right thing. I'm the moral thing I am convinced I did the legally right thing because I'm going well I'm not going to jail for somebody who did this I'm not going to cover it up just to keep peace in a family I'm not I'm not doing prison time because I didn't turn this person in so I am convinced I did the right thing legally I am convinced I did the right thing morally uh, when those things happen they need to be treated seriously especially in the days that we're living in right now because I'm telling you it is rampant and so um, it just it causes us as Christians to live soberly which means we take this world and the things that are going on in it seriously we take the warnings of the Word of God seriously we take the promises seriously as well so we're told to live soberly righteously and godly in this present world and that we do the right thing somebody say amen now are there consequences for doing the right thing people people lose their jobs all the time because they refuse to cheat they refuse to steal they refuse to cover things up that cover it up they refuse to do and 
Things like that happen all the time. They, they are whistleblowers. Things are going wrong. Fortunately, they're whistleblowers that protect someone who says, hey, my company is dumping illegal waste out here and it's going into groundwater and I have the evidence for it. And if that company fires them, or takes legal action against them, they're protected by the law. And I think that's good too. So uh, I will just tell you this. There is, a, there is a young person for you to pray for. Uh, there is an alleged evil perpetrator that whether it disgusts us or not, that's somebody else to pray for. Because without Christ, they're going to die and go to hell. And uh, I believe God forgives sins. Don't you? Somebody say amen. Amen. Uh, Genesis chapter 29. So I just kind of wanted you aware of a um, little bit about what's going on. The other night, uh, Lindsay, we, we pulled in and Lindsay said that uh, she keeps a gas can over here by her lawnmower and she looked out one morning the gas can was thrown up under the church van and she went out there to pick it up and there was no gas in it somebody had stolen the gas out of her, about five dollars five gallons worth of gas out of her gas can well we pulled up the security tape for the night before Sure enough, about 4 o'clock in the morning, we see a car pull down in the driveway, pull over next to the church van. Somebody gets out of the car, walks across the parking lot. Now, I know where they went. They went to a house that is nearby our church that has been selling drugs out of that church for several years now. And this is why we put up, uh, it was John's idea to put up signs on the parking lot saying, uh, warning, you're, uh, you're, you're under video surveillance because if they're selling meth, meth people are like paranoid about everything. And if you tell them they're on camera, they're going, what, I'm on camera? They freak out. And it actually had an effect. But since people, since, some people living next to the church, by our church, in the neighborhood of our church, have started selling drugs the first weekend. I had just bought brand new lawn equipment, brand new weed eater, brand new uh, leaf blower, all kinds of stuff, like $300 worth of stuff. That came up missing the first weekend. And I'm going, I just bought that stuff. And... Um, so then we would see them on the security camera. You can't get an identification out of somebody that late at night, but we knew we had it going on, and now they're stealing gas, and I'm thinking seriously about, well, I won't tell you what I'm thinking seriously about. How's that? Let's get into the Word of God, because there's good stuff in here. This is Jacob, verse, Genesis 29, verse 1. Let's pray, Father, ask your blessings on your word tonight. We thank you, God, for uh, being with us. Lord, Father, we know, God, we know that our life is going to come to an end of this world. We know it. We know, God, that it is in our flesh nature that death does terrorize us. It does. That's biblical. The terrors of death you talked about in your word. Lord, we get afraid of dying. We get afraid of how painful that might be. We get afraid of people killing us. But Father, we're going to die anyway. Something is going to slay every one of us. I'd rather it be because I was serving you at the time is what I'd rather it be. And so, Father, help us, dear God, to, to not shy away 
from that, but embolden us, empower us. Lord, as your servants, as soldiers in your army, Father, to recognize that we are already dead to this world. It means nothing to us. And the things that are most precious to us, Father, they're going to be with us in heaven anyway. And so, Father, Lord, just give us grace as we live in these days that we live in. And help us, dear God, that it's like, Lord, I've prayed to you, I don't know how many times, God, you almost took me out of this world one day. And, Father, when you are going to do it for real, Lord, I don't want to be afraid. I do not want to be afraid. I want to be like Stephen. That forgives those who take my life. I want to be like Paul who says for me to live as Christ to die as gain. Because Father I know what awaits us on the other side. And Lord I get excited sometimes when I think about it. So Father bless your people tonight. Bless your word Lord. Thank you God for all that you do for us. We pray in Jesus name and. All of God's people said, Amen. Jacob went on his journey and came into the land of the people of the east. And he looked, and behold, a well in the field. And lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks, and a great stone was upon the well's mouth. Now, hold your Bible there. I'm not putting anything up on screen for you tonight. I'll make you open your Bible. How's that? This is, this is your pastor training you to read your own Bible. Look down at your Bible. Open up your Bible to the verse so you can look at it yourself, know what page it's on, make notes on it, get familiar with it, Say, hey, I know that story, and you turn right to it in the Bible. Now, I just got to find it. Oh, let's see here. Where is that woman at the well story? Huh? John? Genesis? No, that's 29. We're, we're, I'm making the, I'm showing a comparison between Genesis 29... And, um, huh? Oh, it's in John. John 4, maybe. Maybe I'm in the wrong place. I know I'm in John, though. It's John. Um, it is John. Yes, I knew it was John. That well. Listen, listen to this. John chapter 4. Uh, verse 5, then he cometh to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, being uh, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Well, lo and behold, you know what we're going to fix and have here? A woman come and draw water. Okay? But there's a problem here. And so... And it was about the uh, sixth hour. And there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus is no typical Jew. Somebody say amen. That means he didn't have a bank. Or a deli. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that said to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which give us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, take that now. Let's go back to Genesis 29. 
And so here is Jacob. He's a picture of Christ because he is the bridegroom. He is the one. He's the son of Abraham who seeketh a wife. And he's doing just like Abraham told Eleazar. When it comes to Isaac, my son, I don't want you to get one of these nasty, skanky women of the Canaanites. I want you to go to our land and from our people, I want you to get a wife fit for my son. And you're going to be under this testimony, this promise, until you fulfill it. And that's exactly what Abraham's servant, Eleazar, went and did. He went and brought him back the, the woman called Rebekah. So now Jacob is uh, at the well, verse 2, but there's a great stone upon the well's mouth. Now watch this. And thither were all the flocks gathered, and they rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the sheep and put the stone again upon the well's mouth in his place. Jacob said unto him, My brethren, whence be ye? And they said, Of Haran are we. And he said unto him, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And he said unto him, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And behold, Rachel, his daughter, cometh with the sheep. That was what Jacob was waiting to hear. Because his mother had told him, You go down to where our people are. Don't do what your brother did, Saw, uh, Esau, who got wives from these evil Hittites because those wives were a thorn in Isaac and Rebekah's life all the time that they were there. They never approved of the wives of Esau. They never did. This is why she's telling her son Jacob, Jacob, you don't make the mistake your brother did. You go down there and you get you the right wife. Okay, remember, remember the mother. Mother represents heaven, Jerusalem above, which is free. Heavenly Jerusalem, that's who we're born under. And so he hears of Rachel, uh, his daughter. In verse 7, and he said, Lo, it is high day, neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. Water ye the sheep and go and feed them. And they said, We cannot. Until all the flocks be gathered together. Now think about this now. Who are sheep? They're the chosen ones of Christ. When he separates out the sheep from the goats, he will choose the sheep. Uh, I'm going to try to say this delicately in mixed company. Ron and Sandy brought me something that they had... Uh, Picked up from a magazine, a, a lady they know, I think, raises goats, keeps goats, something like that, and knows a lot about them, and showed them this article, and she said, this article is true. She gave me a copy of the article. I've got it upstairs. I don't know. If, I told John that he could grab it and look at it. But there's something about the nature of goats that is, I believe, one of the reasons why they represent those that have been rejected by Christ as opposed to the sheep who are chosen by Christ. Sheep do well in a flock. They stay together in a flock. Goats, they can be herded. But by golly, if they don't want to be, they don't have to be. And another thing about goats, and again, I'm trying to say this delicately as I can. When a, when a male goat is in season and he seeks out a mate, if a female goat is not available, and I'm not making this up, Keep your women and your young ladies out of the goat pen. Because they will go after them. It's in their nature. And I went, 
That's sick. But if you remember, you go back now to the law. And I've counted somewhere about five or six different times when God told both man and woman alike, that's an abomination unto me. I'm not going to put up with it. And God knew exactly what he was talking about. Now put that on the spiritual level. Anytime you have animals in the Bible, they are going to be a picture of spirits in the spiritual realm. You have birds, you have good birds, peaceful birds, beautiful birds, birds that sing beautiful songs. How many of you love to hear crows singing in the morning? Get out of here. You're on the goat side of the church. If anybody don't want to be with him, move over here, all right? And in the animal kingdom, they're good animals representing good spirits. They're evil animals representing evil spirits. Jesus makes that clear in Matthew chapter 25 when he's separating the sheep from the goats. He's talking about the church and the lost people. Even with, even with vegetation, the wheat and the tares, there's, there's that spiritual connection there. They are there for our, for our learning, for our teaching. And I believe that the sons of God in Genesis 6 that sought out wives from the son of men are an example of that activity. That is, to me, that is why ultimately God said, don't do this. Because yes, it is a perversion that actually is carried on in quite a few places. There are actually, there are actually retreats in California that you can go to you pick out whatever animal you want and I'm not that's disgusting but that's the truth okay so anyway but these are all sheep the sheep represent the children of God the children of the kingdom they always follow their shepherd so on and so on and so on but and Jacob is asking now it's uh, it's high day uh, you got a bunch of cattle here. Why aren't they? Why aren't they drinking? Water the sheep. In verse eight, they said, "We cannot until all the flocks be gathered together. Until they roll the stone from the well's mouth, then then we water the sheep." In other words, these people here were not able to move that stone. Now I want you to ponder that for a minute. Are there not times in your life when you would love to have access to the well of water of Jesus Christ? And I mean prayer time with him, Bible time with him, and yet because of the weight of sin or the weight of whatever, there's devils all over you, you find yourself not even hardly able to pray. How many has that ever happened to? It happens to your pastor. So I got to believe it happens to you. Uh, in fact, turn to First Peter. Turn to First Peter. Here's the stone. Do you remember when Jesus went in John 11 to raise Lazarus from the dead? What was separating the one who had the power to give life from the one who was dead? A stone. And Jesus, who is willing to give life, cannot give life because they have rolled a stone in front of that tomb making it and could Jesus have just went like that like a little finger deal and waved his hand and moved the stone yeah but he wanted them to understand I didn't put the stone there you did 
Now you go remove that stone. And I, the first time I heard this message preached to me from Pastor Reg Kelly, I could, it, I started listening to it and had to stop. He actually came and preached it here. And I'd already heard the message. He came and preached it here. And God had me so under conviction about people in my past who I'd offended so deeply and so bad that if they never, ever gave their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, their blood would be directly upon my hands and I knew it. And Jesus said to those that had put the stone there, take you away the stone. You take it away. You put it there. What kind of stone was that? It was, in verse 8 of 1 Peter chapter 2, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. It is sometimes why I at times we'll get afraid of preaching certain things. It's not that I don't believe they're, they're true. It's not that I don't believe that we all need to hear it. But it is because at many times in my past, because I've let my flesh get in my way, I have, rather than trying to just nurture people into following the Word of God, I pounded them into it, and in that sense, I rolled a stone of offense in front of them. And it wouldn't surprise me if they ever came to the Lord after that. Churches, and it doesn't matter what kind, how big the church is, how little the church is, what kind of people the church there, that are their go-to, what kind of man the pastor is, is the pastor's wife, doesn't matter. Churches in general, because they're built up of humans, are capable of offending lost people. Who It'll be a miracle of God if they ever walk back in this place again. I said something to a couple of ladies one time that have been coming here for years. And I said something stupid to them at the end of the service and I realized it they haven't been back since in fact not too long after they quit coming here one of the ladies her marriage I knew there was problems there anyway but her marriage fell completely apart her and her, and her husband busted up she was having an affair with some somebody else so I could just say well it was her sin and on and on and on. But I knew what I said was wrong. And I did try to call that afternoon and apologize. And I could tell they were not really wanting to hear it. I did it one time with Sister Linda Toomey several years ago. She had just found out some bad news from the doctor. I was trying to lighten the situation up and, ir and irresponsibly made a stupid joke and she immediately said that's not funny and I went oh no and I cried and bawled and squalled over that all day long and finally late that afternoon early evening she finally called me back we talked it over and I said, Linda, I am so sorry. And uh, I was always careful with her and David both after that. Never wanted to, I wouldn't want to offend her, but I did. And if we're not careful, we can roll stones of offense in front of people's lives. And they will never. So let's go back now to Genesis 29 the cattle are there the sheep are there the wells there the waters there but there's a stone keeping them from from it let's look at Israel right now 
the people of Israel. There is a stone of offense that has been rolled in front of them that separates them from their true Messiah, Jesus Christ. It was put there because God knew their heart and he knew he had long suffered with them since the days of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the way to the days of Moses, all the way through the judges, all the way through the kings of Israel, all the way up until the time of Christ, all the way through at least part of the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And finally Paul said, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not going to synagogues anymore. I go into a new town. I'm going to go out where all the Gentiles are hanging out and I'm going to talk to them. Because I can see clearly that my fellow brethren, the Jews, the Israelites, they are, they are turned their back so far against God. And God has placed a stone between them and the gospel and they are not able to move it. And that's what's going on here. So they said, verse 8, we cannot until all the flocks be gathered together until the, they roll the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. I'm, but I will tell you, there is coming a time when God's going to roll the stone away. Verse 9, And while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass when Jacob, now Jacob's with all these other people, and he's very capable of moving the stone. But something's holding him back. He doesn't know what Rachel looks like, doesn't know anything about her. He just knows by the Holy Ghost, I believe, that she's the one he's waiting on. And while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near. <laughs> I don't care if that stone weighed a thousand pounds, that boy was going to move that stone. <laughs> You do anything when you're in love, won't you? Rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. And Rachel's probably going, Whoo, what a man. And look at verse 11. Look what, look what Laban, or Jacob did. Jacob bent down and kissed Rachel. It didn't take long for the first date. And lifted up his voice and wept. Why is he weeping? Why is he weeping? Emily, why is he weeping? Huh? He's in love. He is weeping for joy. And I want, you, I want you to think about this now. I want you to just kind of pause. And I want you to just kind of look maybe up at the ceiling for a while. And I want you to meditate on this. God has not forsaken the people whom he foreknew. When you look at Joseph, we're going to get to Joseph. And when you see Joseph, finally, he's, he's there in the, in the meeting hall with his father's sons, his brothers. He knows who they are. They do not know who he is. And he sees them and he is so overwhelmed. He can no longer contain it. He goes into another room, shuts the door, and cries and weeps. 
He doesn't sound like a man that's mad at his brothers for trying to have him killed and then sold into slavery. Because look where he is now. Had that not happened, would Joseph now be the second, basically, below the Pharaoh of Egypt as far as power and might and wealth is concerned? No. And he realizes now that all the bad, terrible things that happened to him since he was 17 years old, that God had done it for a reason. To bring him and put him into a place where he now is going to be the savior of his brethren. Again, he knows who they are. They don't know who he is. And finally, he, can, he can't hold it in anymore. He comes back out. And while they're looking, see, and all this time he's been speaking to them in Egyptian. Even though he knows their language, he knows Hebrew. He's, and, and, and somebody's interpreting for him. But now he comes out and he says, I want everybody out except you guys. Clear the room. And then he looks all, looks them all right in the eye. And in their language, he says, it is I, Joseph, be not afraid. And you can imagine his brothers being stunned. And the Bible says that he went to every one of his brothers, fell on their neck, kissed them, and wept on every one of them, loving them. And then, please tell me, how is our father doing? Our father's fine, Joseph. He's the one that sent us for bread because he heard that there was a great man in Egypt that had bread. Boy, have we got to come up with some story to tell daddy because we told him you were dead. Now we got to go back and tell him you're not. I'm sure Joseph's like, don't worry about it. I think once dad finds out I'm alive, I don't think he's going to be angry at anybody. And this is what we have here. He goes right over to Rachel. He is immediately in love with her. And he lifted up his voice and he wept in praise and joy to God. We know how the story goes, but ask yourself this question. At this point, do you think Jacob will ever divorce Rachel? This is a woman, he's, without really knowing her, this is the woman that he knows he's been waiting on all his life. This is the woman his mama probably had in mind when, he sent him out, when she sent him out there. And what I'm meaning by that is, I want, to, I want you to think about something for a minute. Husbands, have you ever been offended by your wives? Well, the answer is yes. You don't have to say it. I'll say it for you. Ladies, have you ever been offended by your husbands? You can say, I, I'll say yes for you. You don't have to say it. You know, you don't have to leave them. You don't have to put them out. Why, you don't even have to train them in your way. You know what's best to do? Just love them. Just love them. That'll, that'll roll away all the stones of offense. It will. And uh, Jacob told Rachel, verse 12, that he was her father's brother. and That he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. Jacob's probably going, hey, I thought we was on date here. And it came to pass when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and 
brought him to his house, and he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely thou art my bone and my flesh. Where'd you heard that from? Genesis 2. And he abode with him the same space of a month. Uh, by the way, apparently Jacob doesn't have anything else to do, does he? He can't go back home right now because Esau's still there and Esau's still going to kill him. So, yeah, I, you know what? i got nothing else to do. Why don't you just let me settle out here? And I'll, help all these, I'll help all these girls with their sheep every day. And, and, you know, well, you know, especially Rachel. I don't mind helping her too, you know. And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me what shall thy wages be? Now this is going to be important. Later on, Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Gentile. Or I'll say it the way the Bible does, Leah. Because in this story, Leah is the Gentile. And the name of the younger was Rachel. Israel. Now, Rachel's pretty. Leah, eh. Leah was tender-eyed. I don't know exactly what that means, but it, she just probably wasn't all that great looking. But Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I'll serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. In other words, I won't even lay a hand on her. I'll give you seven years of my labor if you'll let me marry Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. You got the job. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. Now people again, every time I say Jacob, in your heart I want you to say Jesus. Jesus has already been amongst his brethren 2,000 years ago. And he left this world with a broken heart. Because the woman he loved didn't love him back. Didn't love him back. That's hard to take. I remember the first girl that I really liked. In sixth grade. I didn't know it at the time. But she was a pastor's daughter. I didn't see her in first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. I saw her in sixth grade. Well, that was the year that her dad took over being pastor of First Baptist Church here in town. And I thought she was the prettiest thing in the world. And I tried to write her a note, J.R., and uh, once I got the note writ, then it only took me three months to figure out how to get it to her. By then, most of the school year was gone. I finally got up enough nerve to give it to her, and I never heard no more after that. In other words, she didn't write it back. She didn't throw it back. She probably just rolled her eyes and ignored it. And there were songs on the radio that every time I'd hear them, I'd think of her. Okay? But she wasn't, she wasn't meant to be for me. In fact, I now know that, and her dad, don't get me wrong, her dad was a good man. I believe her dad was a good pastor. But her older sister, who is my sister's age, is a committed lesbian and just 
girl, now a woman, she's my age, uh, I've seen the Facebook post, she favors that now and thinks that's a, some great thing that her, and, that her sister and her wife are doing well together and they're adopting children and I'm just going, boy God, you knew what you were doing there, didn't you? So young people, let me just tell you something. Let God pick your spouse. Let God do it. I promise you, he'll do a better job. And you'll love her. And she'll love you. And if you let God pick her, you're going to have some happy, happy times together. Amen? And she'll be worth waiting for. Seven years. I got to work seven years for this girl. But in his mind, it just seemed like a couple of days went by, and all of a sudden now it's his wedding day. So next Sunday night, we'll get into exactly how ticked off he was after the first wedding, all right? But these types and these shadows, people, they're there for a reason. They're there to teach us how God sees Israel. There's this, the story of Israel right here, and the story of the Gentiles, and how we, how we fit into the picture. We weren't the first ones he chose. But we are the ones who are fulfilling the purpose of the one who called us to be part of the bride of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Father, what a beautiful story. This Bible, these things are woven into the scriptures. They're there for our learning, our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world have come. We thank you, God, for giving our minds and our hearts so many th great things to ponder and to think about. And Father, I pray for these young people. Lord, if, if we adults could just sit down with them and Try to tell them, don't go after the first guy you see. Don't go after the first girl you see. God, if we could just, it, Father, if you would just lay it in their hearts to wait on God's man for that young lady's life or God's woman for that young man's life. Lord, if you would have just instilled that in their hearts, Father, they would find a very, very happy life in this world. No marriage is perfect. No couple is perfect. No husband, no wife is perfect. Our lives sometimes are filled with good days and sometimes not. But Father, overall, you teach us the great, great, beautiful story of Christ in his church. And Father, how sometimes we as the bride, sometimes we don't treat our husband very good. Sometimes we don't treat him right. And yet he still loves us and he long suffers with us and he forgives us. And he hears us when we pray and he knows what we need and he always supplies that need. He always is there to give gifts to his bride, to make her happy. And I pray, dear God, Father, that we as the bride of Jesus Christ would be just as happy and satisfied to wait for the day of the marriage, the day of the wedding, the day when all will be fulfilled, God, because once we do, we won't be sorry we waited. And Father, when we get there, Lord, it'll be, it'll be like, Father, it was just a few days. In fact, your word says that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And a thousand years waiting on the Lord is, is just like waiting a day. So Lord, bless your word and give us wisdom out of it. 
Teach us to observe these things and to remember them, Lord. Give our hearts understanding, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.